Okay, so I got two very short lectures to go uh, to finish up uh, Wi Fi. Uh, this one is uh, Yarabali teaching um, a constrained access protocol. Um, it is the information from Yarabali came from this website. Uh, it's also in the book um, in the edge um, in the later on in the book. These, uh, you know, whatever nine pages talk about, and I will play the video over here. Okay. Or what we've done is looked at communication from the wireless uh, Bluetooth so, standpoint. So um, just um, chat something up to normal chat. To it. In general, with communication have a is question. at some point, we, if you think of the protocol stack, we have our wireless communication, which is our data link layer. This is where we're doing wireless communication. Now, obviously, if we want our devices to be on the internet, we think of them as having an IP layer. And on top of that, we have a TCP or a transport layer, TCP slash UDP layer. And now we will have application layer on top. Now, traditionally, what we have done with devices that are uh, that have continuous power like a laptop and desktops is we we have a rather bloated application layer we use sockets for communication and on top of that we use protocols like http for communication so http is an application layer protocol now http it works great for machines that are that are not resource deprived but they don't HTTP as a protocol uh, does not work if you have a resource constrained device. And for that, you mean not a lot of memory, not a lot of power, not a lot of processing speed. So processing, memory, power. So when we have resource constrained devices that we want to connect, which is the, which is kind of the premise of Internet of Things, we can't use a bloated protocol like HTTP. So the, the IoT world has come up with its own set of protocols to deal with this issue of resource constrained communication. So we'll just uh, visit some of these so that you can get a sense of what these what, what is uh, around in the IoT domain as far as communication is concerned. So we'll mainly focus on two uh, protocols. The first one is, uh, is as the name is appropriate, it's called COAP, which is a constraint access, constraint application uh, protocol. Uh, and we will also look at uh, MQTT, which has a kind of a weird name, um, but it is, it's called message queue telemetry transport. Uh, both of them are, as I said, basically geared towards uh, communication in the embedded world, embedded IoT communication. Yeah. So let's take a look at how these work. So the first one, which is the constrained application protocol, differs from, it's actually built off of HTTP. So it's like HTTP-like, but HTTP-like, but in, in the sense that you do, uh, the accesses are very similar. You do get, you do post, you do uh, uh, put, and you do delete. These are basically uh, HTTP commands. They're very similar to that. The difference is that HTTP is based on TCP, whereas CO constraint access protocol is based on UDP. Recall that TCP is a connection oriented protocol, which means we, the, a server or a client will establish a connection with the server and the communication is done over a, a connection for the duration of the communication, the connection is on. Uh, whereas COAP works on UDP, which means that it's connectionless. 
and it allows what we call as a disconnected operation, which means that the two, the client and the server are not connected to each other and therefore they can act asynchronously. It's a much simpler protocol than TCP. Too. Yes. And some of the highlights of the constraint access protocol are there. Uh, the first, uh, I'm, I'm just going to list some highlights. One of the first thing is it has a, a small header. In fact, it, its header is only four bytes. And, and a lot of the, the options that it has, optional fields, are in binary. So our, our messages that we send, and we, because we're using message uh, UDP, we send our messages, our messages are sent as UDP datagrams. And these datagrams are uh, typically we all of our message will fit within a datagram. And the advantage of that is there's no question of getting fragmented in, in flight. Uh, it's much faster because they're, they fit within one packet and, and they don't, there's no need to uh, break it up. So the other in, interesting thing is uh, of, of our uh, constraint access protocol is um, it can be used because it is simple enough. Uh, it can be, uh, you can use uh, protocols like SMS to send UDP uh, packets or packets that are uh, pertinent to uh, constraint access protocol. Uh, you can also use a bridge. So uh, since we are already familiar with HTTP, we can create a constraint access protocol to HTTP bridge so that we can now communicate with existing devices that are HTTP uh, uh, respond, respond to HTTP by creating a bridge between the two. Uh, the other uh, thing that we also have is uh, we, um, because, because we have um, this, this UDP, which is not only connectionless, but it's also unreliable. We need to be able to provide some reliability. And so the quality of service of reliab uh, reliability is accomplished by sending messages that are of different types. We call them confirmable messages and non-confirmable messages. So in other words, when we send a confirmable message, we are requesting that the counterpart respond with an acknowledgement. Therefore, we can be sure that the message has been delivered. Um, the other thing that we are also able to do um, is we can also build security. Uh, security is, uh, is not directly part of constraint access protocol, but what we do is we use something called uh, DTLS, which is, uh, which is the datagram equivalent of the transport layer service, um, you know, transport layer service for security. Uh, this, this makes it now uh, more secure so that we don't have to uh, stick to uh, an unsecure communication. Um, and also there is security and also we have encryption uh, built into this. Uh, the most important, it, the, the beauty of constraint access protocol is with all these features, we can still implement constraint access protocol on a device that has less than 10 kilobytes of RAM. Okay. There, there's some obvious uh, disadvantages here uh, because this is uh, because we have, uh, this is a, we're using UDP, it's really a one-to-one -one protocol but uh, it's not a problem because we, we UDP supports multicast, so we can also do multicast. So we just have to, uh, some of the implementations of constraint access protocols don't have the bro broadcast impl multicast implementation, but it can easily be added. Um, we'll next take a look at our, an other alternative, which is uh, kind of catching up as, uh, as slowly as uh, to become the default uh, the IoT protocol for communication. All right, that's one. So yeah, Austin asked, is there a client and a server? Yeah, it's still a server. So you got your IoT device, 
uh, and you basically set up a you know a IP address to send your UDPs to. I guess I think so. All right, I got another one. Okay, so as you can tell from the from the dialogue, these were videos we made for our MOOC, uh, and then again down here um, uh, is the webs the the places that Yerabali used to. Uh, create the lecture, and this, just like the other one, is also in the book, um, in the other order, but in the book. Okay, so that's this video here. So we've looked at constraint access protocol. Now let's take a look at another alternative, which is MQTT. And MQTT stands for Message Queue Telemetry Transport. Um, this came out of, uh, the name comes out of uh, a project from IBM that uh, just the name uh, was inherited because of an earlier project that they used. But what MQTT is, is a publish, subscribe model for communication. Uh, the traditional uh, model for communication is what we call as a client server, where the client and the server are both connected to each other for the duration of their communication. The pub sub, as it's commonly referred to, works off of an intermediary. That is, you have a intermediary called a broker, and you have clients or publishers, if you will. So we have, let's say, a temperature sensor uh, temp sensor, uh, which is basically an embedded device which has a sensor on it, and it's going to be uh, publishing topics. The in the world of MQTT, we use the word topic. A topic is uh, how we refer to a service. So uh, it publishes a topic, uh, which is temperature. In, in our case, the topic is temperature. And the current value of the uh, that it's sending is, uh, let's say it says that the temperature is 21 degrees centigrade. So that's the published message it sends to the broker. Um, and the broker uh, keeps, keeps track of all the published information. And what it does is it serves this information to any subscriber. So these are subscribers. What the subscribers do is they express their interest in a topic by sending a subscription message. So they say, I want to subscribe to the topic, which is the temperature. The topic that I want to subscribe to is temperature. And so our topic IDs have to be unique. So this one says I want to subscribe to temperature. This one says similarly that I want to subscribe to temperature. And now when there is data available, so there's a similar subscription. And so when the broker has information, it's gonna send out publish messages. It publishes, oh, you asked for this information. So here's the information I have, which the temperature is 21 degrees centigrade. Now. Uh, it's the same thing here. It's going to publish the information to all subscribers who have subscribed to that particular topic. Now, these subscribers can be something as powerful as a laptop or something as simple as a mobile device. It doesn't matter. So what this allows, what this MQTT at its heart allows us to do is we are, we do what is a, a uh, the simple idea of decoupling. So in, in the client server model, the client and the server are coupled. They're co connected to each other. Here there's decoupling. There's decoupling in time, which means that uh, they do not have to be running with the, the, the publisher and the subscriber shouldn't, don't have to be running at the same time, right? Do not need to run simultaneously at the same time, uh, which, which is good because the publisher might just publish its information and go down and the subscriber can wake, come in and say, I want, want to get this information and gets this information. They can de be decoupled in space 
which is also nice because they don't have to uh, so they do not need to know each other's ip address ip or port they don't have to know that because a broker is the intermediary that will facilitate the communication and they do not have to be synchronized because they can run asynchronously which is again a time thing um mqtt has uh, if you're wondering where mqtt is being used these days in fact if you have a mobile version of facebook if you're using facebook on a mobile device not from your browser but if you have a mobile the mobile app for facebook it actually uses mqtt uh and so it's become uh, it's been deployed a lot uh, mainly because of of its uh, it's it, not just because of the published pub sub sub model but because it's uh, it's it's efficient in terms of energy because the packets are very small and in terms of time so uh, what what we will find out as we look look around on the pubs uh, on these devices is um, because mqtt is being deployed a lot uh, it as we need to also worry about things like security and stuff like that so uh, fortunately the security is been achieved by using tcp with uh, uh, the transport layer service proto uh, encryption mechanism therefore uh, we can now uh, we can now do secure communication what is also uh, what is also possible is um, there are some times when we want mqtt to operate in a disk in in a in a fashion where uh, where we we want we could use a different um, a mechanism where devices can just come up and go down so if you have sensor networks which are typical of our of embedded devices sensor networks can use a different version of mqtt called mqtt sn it is optimized for sensor networks where they where they are not connected all the time in fact there's a version of mqtt called mqtt s which which actually supports uh, zigbee and mqtt s is also uh, there's a version of mqtt which is uh, which operates on top of udp rather than operate on tcp so uh, mqtt as i said is now uh, if you if you look at the trajectory if we look at the deployment if you look at the deployment of of these two technologies over time if you were to mine the internet you will find that constraint access protocol uh, over time was being adopted a lot people used it a lot it's growing still and uh, somewhere in the mid 2000s or uh, sorry 2010s or so uh, mqtt deployment began it began in earnest and it wasn't much but thanks to things like facebook uh mqtt is kind of taking over as the default protocol um simply because it has this nice model of uh, secure communication and uh, efficient communication for constrained devices and this pub sub model okay there we are okay so close that one all right so uh, my goal was to give you um now this one does have a central server, uh, the broker in the middle. And like I said, there's uh, some web pages there in that in these uh, doc files, and the uh, book is have has information on it. Okay, so um, So this um, this chapter deals with Lab Four, and there are two Lab Four options. One of which will show up tomorrow, I hope. Um, it seems to be working now, and having to do with the wide area networks. Okay, so um, this is Chapter Seven um, in the book. Okay, so. 
uh, we saw we started with the uh, personal area network that was a sub gigahertz, uh, the Bluetooth, um, and then we went to local area networks that was Wi Fi. Uh, and now this is a um, another paradigm for any questions before I, I, I switch gears. Any questions? Uh, as always, chat it or or unmute yourself if you have a question. And so the paradigm here is um, um, large distances, uh, which include the the two labs that are available for lab four, the cellular network um, text messaging lab and the new lab that I'm gonna demo today on long range. Uh, in this category is another long range protocol, which I'm not gonna talk about, but it's in the book called SIGFOX. Um, and so this is the lab, one lab four con uh, configuration. Uh, let's see if I can find, it's got a uh, obsolete uh, phone module. I bought them last year when I first envisioned doing this um, class. It's a 2G network. Um, and so this particular hardware will stop working at the end of the year, uh, but that's fine for you. You can still do, um, you can still do lab four <laughs> if you finish before December 31st. Uh, it's got an antenna. That's the, uh, that's the phone antenna, the green thing on the bottom. Oh uh, yeah, I can, I can write on the screen. Okay, it's got an antenna right here. Uh, this is the actual phone chip. And if you remember what is the paradigm for, for IoT this whole semester is we will, someone else will build a silicon uh, to implement the IoT protocols and the physical layer uh, of the stack is it typically done in uh, hardware on a chip that we put on a board that we buy and hook up to our system. So this is, other than the fact that this is obsolete, uh, this paradigm for deploying IoT is uh, pretty typical, okay? Uh, this particular lab has, um, has two USBs. Uh, this one is just for, for charging the battery. Uh, it charges the battery. Uh, in this, um, in this uh, the way this particular chip works is the battery has to be plugged in because it powers, the battery is powering that chip there. Okay. And then this second USB cable is used to program the, the uh, microcontroller. Um, the, the starter code shows you how to collect data off of this sensor board. So if you want to text, uh, you want to ask the, you know, you could, the, so the lab typically is you will text a, a message to the phone, what's the temperature where you are, and then the thing will respond with the current temperature. Okay, that's sort of the configuration for uh, one of the options here in lab four. Okay, uh, where does the word cellular come from? And that is um, the world is connected into cells um, and the towers are separated, not necessarily uniformly, but they're separated in physical space and in frequency. So the letters in this, uh, in this uh, diagram, the letter A means it's using the same frequency. So all the A's on this plot use the same frequency. Um, that way, uh, if you're sitting here with your cell phone and you connect up to a tower, uh, you know the tower knows about you and you know about the tower uh, because you know what frequency it is. Okay, so as it locks onto the, uh, the, the signal, um, it, uh, uh, it's a con it, and uh, and the uh, the the two frequencies um, that it you know that the two towers that have the same frequency are far enough in distance such that a phone would only see one of them and not both of them. Okay, um, uh, we're obviously talking about we're not going to talk about voice and audio. Uh, we're going to talk about basically SMS uh, text messages. And so um, the protocol has, has uh, changed the generations over the years. And every time there was a generation, uh, it got faster, okay? 
uh, and now we're launching into the 5G world. And so I got a couple more slides on this, uh, but I can ask the what is it? What are the consequences of using uh, tw uh, 26 gigahertz? So that's a rhetorical question to the to the crowd. If I choose a protocol at 26 gigahertz, what does that mean? What two things does that mean? Penetration is going to be bad. Yeah, so that's the the wavelength uh, is down to you know 12 millimeters, one centimeter. Uh, and what is the uh, what is the relationship between the wavelength of the of the EM wave and the ability to penetrate? Inversely. Yeah. So uh, you're you can't go through anything that's bigger than a centimeter wide. Okay. Go go. Hey, John. There's nothing smaller than a centimeter, and so penetration is a huge problem with with this with these frequencies because the wavelength has gotten smaller. Okay, um, and it's you know the the particular the particular uh, space that these new five G uh, um, um, protocols run in is called millimeter wave because the the wavelength is in the millimeter range okay but that's the bad thing what's the good thing penetration is the bad part what's the good part more bandwidth yeah sure everybody wants more speed right so we're gonna we're gonna send more bits per second okay um, the physical size of everything goes down um, but yeah, the, 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 cause all the, all the signals now are, are, are running in the, above, above a gigahertz. Okay. Okay. So this is just to remind you of where 5G is. Um, obviously, uh, the gamma X-rays, ultraviolets are in the dangerous waveforms, uh, because the wavelengths are small enough to, uh, to break apart DNA. Um, whereas um, the uh, 5G, again, is in that uh, 25 to 30 gigahertz range. There's another one. Yeah. So um, the 5G is actually a lot of frequencies. It's not just the 26 gigahertz. Um, it still will, it will still operate down in the sub gigahertz range uh, or in the three gigahertz range or in the 26 gigahertz range. Um, I don't know if there's any current uh, protocols that run above 39 gigahertz, but obviously they'll get there as they figure stuff out. Um, Um, the purpose of this slide is just to, uh, you know, you've all seen LTE on your phone. Um, and the, um, the purpose of LTE, which stands for long-term evolution, was to uh, provide both a forward and a backward compatible protocol. Um, and so... Um, back in the early days of the cell phone industry, everybody had their own towers and everybody had their own protocol. And you, you know, it was very expensive and stupid to connect to the wrong kind of tower. And so along came the LT, um, um, the LT gener the LTE evolution, which involves this. Um, okay, did I, did, was I, did I do it in the in the next slide. All right, where did I put you this? Okay. Um, 3GPP partnership. Oh yeah, that's the third generation partnership project. Yeah, there it is. Uh, and it was meant as a consortium so that phones could talk to any tower. All, all, of, the, all of the protocols were, well, until they obsolete 
2G, of course, which they're about to. Um, and then actually, op I'm going to obsolete 3G, which is why I'm waiting to see what to do with my lab next year. Um, that the this was a consortium that allowed the uh, the the various players in the field to to use the same towers and to uh, make the phones both forward and backward compatible. So if you buy a phone, it will still work in the new towers. And if you build a new tower, it'll still work with the old phones. Okay, so that's what I mean by forward and backward. Um, I don't have a lot to share about the uh, about the physics of the of the of the cell phone industry, uh, except it uses two kinds of protocols. As far as I can tell, this frequency division is um, more. Um, more prevalent uh, and basically it uses two frequencies to provide full duplex. Okay, so uh, some people call it full duplex. Other people call it duplex. And this is actually different. This is the first protocol that handled duplex. What does it mean? You know what that mean, That term means? Communication goes um, both ways. Uh, both ways at the same time. Now all the all the protocols go both ways. Half duplex uh, can go transmit and receive, uh, but this can transmit and receive at the same time. Okay, and it does it by basically setting up two channels. In this case, two frequencies. One it uses for download, and one it uses for upload. Okay, and then it's time it's time sliced so that more than one phone can still communicate at the same time. Okay. It's time sliced. Uh, and the other is time division duplex. Uh, so I guess if you want to call it, it's still half duplex because it, it doesn't actually transmit and receive at the same time, but it's so fast that, you know, that, that as far as the upper levels are concerned, the uh, upload and download are occurring simultaneously. And again, it divides it into 10 or 20. There's a 10 millisecond window uh, here divided, I think, into 20 uh, sub time intervals that it uses to do the communication. Uh, the other thing that I, I think I've seen is it's, okay, now no, it's a little different slide. And so this is just sort of a, uh, of a, uh, sort of a, a picture of what, available time slots or available uh, available slots that a phone can communicate with okay and so uh, there are channels just like all the other you know Bluetooth and the, all of the all of the um, other protocols would take their waveforms divide it up into channels to allow multiple um, multiple communications simultaneously when it hops around like all the other ones hop around and for all the same reasons. And then it will time slice it as well. We saw that there were uh, multiple time slices. And so when you want to communicate, you get one of those, one of those slots, okay? Um, and this is, you probably know how phones work, uh, but this goes back to our, uh, our, our original discussion and that is, what are the consequences of, you know, of running above 24 gigahertz? And that is, uh, all the losses happen, right? The free space loss happens. The attenuation through um, through objects happens. You don't go through. Uh, there, there's a quote there from the book: at 60 gigahertz, uh, the human body actually uh, no no 60 gigahertz wave goes uh, into the body and out the other side. So basically even humans cast shadows on themselves, right? So, um, you know, how, you, how do you solve this problem is you have to have, uh, you have to have a higher density, uh, you have to have a higher density um, uh, network, right? So you can have these big cellular Oops, these big uh, cells, 
okay, that are broken up into little cells. And the little cells have to be closer. Okay, here's another one. A, a, a small cell, which is um, higher density. Okay. Um, the other thing that's that that I've seen uh, I've seen in uh, in uh, in the this um, the other thing that I've seen in this uh, in this five G world is a technique called beamforming. Okay, and what they do with beamforming. Uh, I read some some proposal out of the, some new 5G protocol. Uh, it, they were doing it in Houston, and basically what they do is they time it so that at time one it it sends or or focuses its antenna, uh, its output signal and its input signal in one direction. Okay, so it's because as you know what causes the what causes the 1 over r drop off right remember that 1 over r squared drop off what was the physical reason that it dropped at 1 over r 1 over r squared what physic what 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 you know think about uh 10th grade math right or 11th grade math in trigonometry, what parameter drops off at R squared? Energy. Okay, but what, okay, I'm thinking about 11th grade uh, trigonometry. Area. Area, okay. So the, the density here, okay, the density of signals drops off at one over um, R squared. And if, but if you can beam form it, okay? If you can beam form it, uh, then you can send the data at what this particular time in that direction, that particular time in this direction. And so you go around the city, go around your cell and time multiplex the waveform in, a, in one direction. Especially if you find yourself a phone here, right? And you find yourself no phone there and a phone here, and no phone, no phone, phone. You can actually now lock in to where your phones are and, and send, send waveforms in that direction, okay? So the point is because, they, because the world wants more speed, because the world wants more speed, uh, they went to a higher frequency, which has more attenuation, which means you've got to work harder to make it actually work. Um, yeah, just to, just another uh, an, an interesting thought question. Okay, to this well, this one works. Yeah, this one works. No, yeah. Um, no, this one. Uh, what do you suppose? Is there any reason? Is there anything? that 300 gigahertz would be used for? Is there any application for, for communication way high? Now, again, we're not talking about, we're not talking about things that are gonna burn up the body, right? They're gonna kill people. We're not talking about a, 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 a military weapon. We're talking about a communication scheme. What application would attenuation not be a would would would, would absorption not be a problem? Line of sight. Yeah. Like so what? Drones. Okay. Okay. You'd have to have line of sight, right? There'd have to be no. Okay. So, okay. Ramesh, I'm teaching. Okay. Say, okay. Hey, so Ramesh. Yeah. Yeah, say hello to my class. We watched two of your midi videos today. <laughs> yeah, you got any questions on, hey, you got any questions? Oh, this is Ramesh on the phone. Any, got any questions on um, uh, co, uh, co, uh, co AP or, or MQTT? Uh, no, now I'm asking the class. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, good. Awesome. Okay, I'll call you back after class. 
Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Fine. Half hour. Bye. Bye. All right. So I don't know what he wanted, but I just hung up on him. Okay. So so what other what are, uh, drones is an example of where you'd have line of sight, right? Space. Uh, in the air. Space. Space. Sure. So yeah, actually, if you look at where they, you know, uh, line of sight. Obviously. Okay. So fine. Um, this is to um, um, those of you who have done those of you who have done you know, labs two, three, and four know that they're not that hard. This is lab four. Um, uh, if you're choosing between the two lab fours to do, um, this particular one uh, is sending, well, it's already sends text messages. What you're to do is to make it receive text messages. Um, receive text messages, uh, display text messages, delete text messages, um, and then interact with the, with the user in some usual way. Like I said, there is a sensor uh, booster pack on here. And so it's a fairly simple, um, uh, it's a fairly simple uh, protocol you basically give it a phone number that you want to send a text to, and you give it an ASCII string, and it sends a text message. Okay. Now the received text messages are a little bit different, uh, a little bit harder, but those who have checked out Lab Four would remind the rest of you who have not is to read the manual. Yeah, don't just guess. Read the description. Uh, that'll save you some time. Uh, but again, it's a fairly a uh, fairly benign lab uh, to do. All right, so in summary, um, you know, uh, uh, to go faster, we have a faster frequency. The faster frequency has pr problems with attenuation. Attenuation is solved with topology and fancy things like beam forming. Okay? Um, and again, that's probably way more about cell phones than I know. Uh, the book's pretty good. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the book that I didn't talk about, uh, that which goes into more of the details. All right. So uh, the other long range um, uh, wide area network is LoRa. So this is not, okay, you can, you can connect LoRa up to the internet, but LoRa is a um, is a wide is a long range um, ooh, one to ten kilometers depending on how good you are with the radio. Again, this is in chapter seven of the book. Uh, okay. All right, and the uh, lab, um, like all the other labs, okay, has the same sort of uh, the same sort of uh, uh, process, and there is a physical layer that implements LoRa on this chip called RA-02 and it's soldered onto the onto this microcontroller board right here this chip here is soldered onto there uh, yeah it's um, you know it's an Atmel um, a microcontroller so it fits into the Arduino family um, this is the more expensive version that um, this that's the Adafruit version. There's an Amazon version that's less expensive. Um, and there'll be links for that in the lab manual when I get it posted, okay. which should be tomorrow, by the way. I'm, uh, my demo works. I just have to write up the finish writing up the assignment. Um, so again, it's a wide area network is where we're going. Um, so it's lo very long distance, well, much longer distance than we've talked about before. Uh, without, so it's not a, you know, third, it's not a 3G PP sponsored protocol. So this is not cell phone technology. It's a different technology. And it's had its, it's a, it has its own consortium, of course. Okay. Um, and so there are really, yeah, you know, on the, on the, uh, the layered, uh, stack. Uh, Laura's 
typically what we refer to as the physical layer and LoRa wide area network is the media access layer. Um, the fundamental reasons on how it is reliable and long distance is it, it uh, mimics the whales and they communicate. And so, uh, and that is by chirping. A chirp means a, a waveform that's, that, that, what you call it, um, uh, linearly in time changes the frequency. So if you were to plot frequency versus time here, all right, you would see that the frequency of this waveform, now this is a artist rendition and the frequencies here are changing a lot, right? This one's 10 times bigger than that one. Um, obviously, we're still fitting inside whatever band, right? We're still sitting inside the 433, you know, plus or minus, wherever the channel number is. We're sitting in a very small amount of frequencies, 433 megahertz. Um, so it's not, the frequency is not chirping. Uh, doesn't, it's not changing dramatically this amount, okay. Uh, but it does, uh, it's called the chirp spread spectrum. Um, there's a couple of terms in here that, that matter to us is how many bits per second can I send? Uh, and then there's this spread factor, which basically is the rate in which, um, the rate in which the frequencies change. So if I'm gonna go from, uh, uh, F1, this is probably a picture of it on the next slide. If I'm going to go from F1 to F2, uh, the two different uh, spreading factors um, have to do how fast do I get from one frequency to the other. Okay? And so, as you might imagine, the, um, the, uh, the bigger the spread factor, okay, the slower it works, because this term right there. Okay? Uh, so, but the bigger the spread factor, the further it goes, and we'll see it. So there is a trade-off here, S, to get uh, speed uh, versus distance. So um, if you increase the spread factor, it will decrease the speed, but increase the distance. Yeah, that's the, but there I bring it up, because spread factor is something you program into the, you program into the uh, into the system. Okay. Um, this term, uh, you can. I don't know why they put it in the denominator. I copied it exactly like the book, uh, but this looks very familiar, by the way. Okay. So if you put these other two terms in here and just ignore them for a second and look at the bandwidth of the channel time some number is the bit rate that has a you've seen that equation before the bit rate like of, shannon channel it's capacity. the shannon channel capacity theorem okay so that's the same bandwidth okay uh that we used in um it's obviously not simple okay uh, and so it has things like an adaptive data rate, depending upon how many other uh, devices are in the in the um, in the field. Um, but you can see it's a fairly low bandwidth. It's a very fairly low bandwidth channel. Okay. Oh yeah. Here's my here's my uh, that's this that's this guy here. Plus there, four hundred and thirty three. 433 megahertz plus or minus 125 kilohertz, right? So again, when it's chirping, the difference between F1 and F2 is less than 125 kilohertz, right? So again, it's not a two to one change. It's very quick. Okay, so that's a long while. Um, here's what, this is a, another, another rendition of what chirping or what, spread factors mean, okay? And so apparently spread factors can go from seven to 12. Uh, again, the faster, uh, 12 is the slow one and seven is the fast one. 
Um, and as you can sort of see, if, at, at a spread factor of seven, uh, I can send more bits per second because I'm I'm going to encode into this waveform, uh, which I think is so it it says it does a bunch, but uh, one of the ones it does is FSK uh, frequency shift on the chirp. Okay, uh, and so and it chirps up and it turns down. Okay, so that's the thing I did from the other slide. So this is a, a plot obviously versus time and um, frequency. Okay, so it's that's what a chirp means. And here's an interesting physical thing. Uh, and that is uh, chirping basically uh, helps uh, with, uh, with spinning out the noise because um, since it can lock onto the chirp, it's really pretty insensitive to the other things that are out there. And so, um, unless it, you know, unless it sees a, you know, the, the analog circuit is looking for a time varying frequency signal at a certain rate, and therefore um, the other noise, because we're still in 433. Megahertz, so we still have all that other stuff occurring. Uh, um, again, uh, have all that stuff occurring um, in in together with it, and so the chirping really does improve the sensitivity. Which is how it obtains the long range. Because the signal can, it still drops off at one over r squared, and it still gets stuck in the in the wall, etc. But because of the chirp, it's easier for the sense for the receiver to lock on to uh, something that is identifiable as a transmitter. Okay, um, you know, it's, imagine a world where there's a room full full of people. Okay, and one of them is singing. Right, everyone's there's 10 people talking and one person singing, and all the sound is is mixed together in the in the um you know added together in the in the noisy space. I promise you you could hear the singing over the talking. Okay. Uh and some of us uh make ourselves known in a crowded room by talking very loudly. But here, there's something very uh, is there something very unique about the about the about the shape of this waveform uh, that makes it easy to feel uh, uh, makes it easy to filter out the, the 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 noise outside of what I'm trying to say. Okay, so I guess just why whales do it, right? Because they have to send their signals a very long distance through a medium which also has a lot of um, other noises and other uh, absorptions. Um, it chirps up, it chirps down. Um, you can uh, uh, you can send uh, you can send multiple simultaneous signals by just having a different uh, spread factor. So again, if uh, if you chirp, if you're chirping at a, at a unique spread factor, then that means that even if there are other um, LORAs sending chirps with different spread factors, uh, you can still pick it out. Okay, again, you can still lock on if you know the spread factor. Okay, you can still simultaneously demodulate multiple chirps at the same, even if they are in the same frequency. And of course, you still have you still have the channels. Okay. Um, and so as long as the rates are different, right, the, the spread factors uh, determine the rate of the chirping, okay? And then to send the data, right, you just frequency shift it, frequency shift the chirp, right? So you have a, you have a frequency and then you can chirp it at another frequency, right? To get the, get the you got the same chirp rate, you just change the center frequency of the chirping and that will that will allow you to demodulate to modulate and demodulate the data. Um, again, it looks like all the other 
the stacks look very similar. Um, like I said, the LoRa is typically what uh, what we put in the physical band. Um, and this is the second time we uh, second lab. Uh, the HC12 was a, a sub gigahertz uh, sub gigahertz uh, chip. Uh, that was running at four. This this lab also runs at 433 megahertz. Apparently, nobody else, nobody's called us up on the phone and asked why we're transmitting at 433, which is the European Union band. But uh, nevertheless, both lab one and this lab four are going to be running at 433 megahertz. Um, uh, it can have a topology. Okay. Uh, and as we saw with thread, so this actually looks very close to a thread protocol where it can use uh, LoRa here, uh, to, or LoRa slash LoRa wide area network to create a mesh or create a, well, it's not a mesh, this is a, a star, to create a star and then bridge that star onto the onto the internet okay uh and so you know as you can see in this particular example they bridged it to uh to the cellular network and so uh where is its application uh long distance whether it be you know you you basically instrument all of your animals right with some sort of gps or or health monitoring, uh, or you put them in the dirt. If you're a, if you're a grape, you know, a grape farmer, um, or you put them in bridges, um, and you're looking for, you know, either damage to the bridges or carbon, you know, carbon dioxide levels, smog levels, uh, or you put them into um, into your home and and um, use it to communicate with. Now, obviously, if it's in one house, you're probably using something like Thread, which is which is a um, uh, not, not. But if you but if you're sort of monitoring the entire community, so let's say you're a you live in one of these gated communities where the central monitoring station, uh, and it could be, you know, it could be a mile, it could be a long distance between the all the apartment complexes and the central uh, monitoring station. And uh, of course, you could use cellular for that as well. But uh, okay, so okay, so uh, here's my demo. Um, it uses, like I said, one of these um, ABR uh, microcontrollers that's Arduino based. Um, can't use these pins. And, but all the other pins are available for, for application. Um, this is the starter code. I've redacted the output so you can focus. I've redacted the debugging so you can focus on how it works. Uh, basically, there's a library, um, radio head, I think is what RH stands for, radio something, whoops, radio head, that's not mine, I think that's what it stands for, uh, is the one who made the driver for that, um, for that, what's that, RA-02, um, which is connected up to the uh, there's the chip select, there's the reset, there's the interrupt pin, and then it uses, like I said, these these other pins down here, uh, the, the synchronous serial pins down there. Um, like I said, we're running at 433. Uh, there's a, you know, there's a red LED here. There's some LED, I don't know what color it is. I don't think it's red. It looked like it's blinking white in my system here. Um, but 
basically drive the reset line low here. Um, you've, you initialize the frequency. Um, and there is a, um, there are commands to set the uh, spreading factor, okay? And the, uh, and the, and the power. Um, and so that, to believe this is the biggest, okay? It uses a CRC um, that we talked about before. So this is the initialization that happens in both the transmitter and the receiver. The starter code is, is one dimensional. I mean, sends it in one direction. And basically, where's the output? Right there, send. Okay. It's just like the text message. It's fairly simple. You see there's no addressing here. Um, uh, this is just the size of the packet. So, um, so that's the number of bytes it sends. And just like lab one, what you'll do is you'll uh, create some sort of protocol with some sort of header checksum something. Well, actually, it doesn't need a checksum because it got one. And then uh, it does acknowledge, OK? Um, well, it acknowledges because the other one sends it back. Uh, but uh, you, you send the data to the radio. You wait for the radio to be sent. Uh, and then this particular starter code will receive, will, will, will echo, well, not echo, but will respond with an acknowledgement. So here's the, uh, so this is the receiver loop. Um, and so if there's data to be received, okay, no up here, available. If there's data, there's the data ready to be received, uh, then you receive it. Um, and then this particular starter code will acknowledge it by sending a packet back. Um, well, okay, so enough of that. That's not the point. Okay, let's, let's so, how about, let's do it still running? Oh, it's still running. Good. So I turned this on at the beginning of, of, of class, and now this is the receive. This is the receiver. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 4,584 uh, packets later, this guy's still receiving packets. So there's a second one. Oh, yeah, I can show you one. So this is, okay. So what it's gonna have when I'm done, it's gonna basically have some switches and lights on it and a display so for you to do something interesting. Uh, but as you can see, uh, and then there's a transmitter over there on the other side. Um, but, you know, to, yeah, when you do this, a line of sight's good. Um, okay, lab, okay, awesome. This is what I'm going to wire up. Yeah, but I'll put this in the lab. Um, so what was the, where am I? Almost done. So what um, uh, what were the takeaways here? Is chirp, what is chirping? Chirping is a is a linear sh uh, frequency shift, a linear frequency shift. Uh, why is it important? Is it allows the uh, the receiver to lock on the signal? Um, uh, how can it overlap other other LORAs? Uh, it can do it two ways. One, it can have the channels. It's got channels that hop, but it can, if you chirp at a different rate, then the, uh, then the transmit, the receiver can actually lock on multiple signals. And that spread factor, if you like, is the rate in which the frequency shifts. Okay? Uh, just like um, thread, uh, this is meant to be an edge technology, you know, out there when things move around. Uh, but longer distance, right? Kilometer, 10 kilometers, uh, depending upon how good your radio is and how good your antenna is. Um, yeah, questions? Yeah, once again, I'm done with stuff. Yeah, um, so once you demodulate, um, Jackson and I were chatting about this, but uh, how do you detect 
the the chirp up and chirp down to you? There's like a zero crossing detector or? Oh, I have no idea. So um, uh, on this particular chip, okay, let me go back to sharing again, sorry. On this particular chip, uh, this guy here is going to receive receiver. Uh, this line here will get any, uh, this will respond to any LoRa incoming packet. Okay. Uh, so if there are multiple transmitters out there, this will toggle. Um, this will come true for all of them, okay? Um, now, what you got to do down here, okay, is you have to embed in the protocol uh, what something more than hello world. You're going to say, you know, hello, Austin. Hey, oh, I guess I was talking more about on the, the radio side. The... I have no idea. I have no idea. Well, okay, there is a, okay, so what do I got to show you? Uh, not a stop share, stop this, this one. I did download not much of the data. There's no, wasn't, I didn't download the whole data sheet. I downloaded this down here, that one. Okay, so this is, oops, come back here. Uh, what do you call it? Let me work this one up in there. All right. Um, not much, you know, how it works. This is where, where I said that uh, it has a lot of mod demodulation, demodulization modes. Um, so yeah, I don't know your answer to your question, um, but Okay, let's see. It doesn't say much how it works, although I did see, um, I, don't, I don't know the answer to your question. I don't think it's in the book either. I don't remember. You said, how does it lock? Is that what the question you asked? Oh, no, just how does it detect the chirps? Oh, like if it's a chirp oh. up or a chirp down. Um, you know, there, there was, I did read something on that. Okay. I didn't understand it. I mean, short of using an FFT, there's got to be an easier oh, yeah, way. No, no, that, that, the no, zero crossing detector. There's, I don't know how it, I don't remember how it works, but I do remember uh, it, it, it had special powers. Um, I don't remember the actual answer to your question, but I do remember reading what it said. Okay, where is it? Four, something, no. Okay, I'm in long range, Laura. I do remember it. It did say something to the, yeah, I don't remember. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't. It didn't, it, since I'm not an integrated circuit designer, it did not make sense to me. But there was something in the book. Yeah, sorry, I, I don't. Yes, something clever is all I know the answer to your um, to your question. It is clever. Um, yeah, because it has to. This is meant to be. Look at the look at the power on this thing. Where's the where's the? Yeah, that that was an interesting product specifications. Uh, yeah, look at. You know. Transmit power, receive power, standby power is pretty low. Um, and to, oh, those are obviously currents. Um, yeah, 
So it, it is meant to be battery powered. Uh, as you saw from the, from the, uh, okay, maybe you didn't see it. Yeah, here, uh, that's a battery, um, that's a battery connector. That's a battery connector. So it's meant to be embedded, uh, be, be, be battery powered, mobile. The interesting is, I don't know the answer to your question, but I do think it's clever. And I did read it somewhere, but it didn't stick with me because it didn't make any sense. Sorry. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't answer that question.